All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Persuasion by the Pint. I'm Jonathan Taylor, along with Sean McCool. Sean, today we're going to be talking about fear and persuasion. We've got fear and a, persuasion, yeah. Fear and persuasion. Fear is a great motivator, is it not? It definitely is. I think we've uh, <laughs> learned that this year. <laughs> well, this past year, I think we've learned it before then, but you know, this past year it kind of really showed up. Um, yeah, fear and persuasion, but this is gonna, it's a little different angle, right? Um, yeah. but it's, it's almost, I think, a lot more like self persuasion than it exactly. is exactly, yeah. you know, using fear to persuade others. So, I think we're gonna go probably a little di different route than maybe you might think of in terms of copywriting or right. just general marketing. This is going to be a little bit more self persuasion, which is very mm -hmm. important because yep. it's, it's probably stopping you from doing some of the marketing and things that you want to do in your life. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. And uh, we're not the experts in this. Um, we got a guest on. I mean, you, you told me we had a guest and yeah. then I looked this guy up <laughs> and I almost didn't show up today. Because I was like, <laughs> man, talk about fear. This guy's intimidating. Yeah. I yep. was like, so I go on his website. He's a badass. He's, he's got a section, you know, right in the in the kind of middle of his homepage. And it says, the resume it says, Olympic level elite athlete. Sure. Technology entrepreneur. He has three, uh, 10 patents and three books that resulted in a presidential recognition for contributions to business and charity. Mm -hmm. A cancer survivor. And a world record holder. Jeez. So, you know, he's, uh, he's, he can probably talk about fear. <laughs> so, and yet, as you, as you said, right when we came on, like he's known as the fear guru. That's right. The fear guru. And not because he's scared. I mean, he probably <laughs> is scared, but it's, you know, we'll, we'll find out where that came from. But, uh, sure. Yeah. I'm sure, uh, there was times that he was definitely scared, but he had to push through it. So, but yeah, I mean, it looks like, uh, I mean, I did see where he kind of fits with our world. He was outside magazines, fittest athlete for 2014. So obviously yeah, that, that yeah, fits. Which, we know I all mean, about that. I yeah. Mean, I mean, we can certainly relate to that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So you I'm excited to have him on. So. <laughs> A couple of beer drinkers, you know, Yeah, we, we like to stay active. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he is the, uh, so he, so we've kind of built this up. We've got Patrick Sweeney. He's the author of the wall street journal bestseller fear is fuel just came out last year and uh during the pandemic so debuted pretty, at number five on the wall street journal list that's right that's, that's right pretty, absolutely pretty cool pretty cool yeah so uh so yeah excited to have him on here shortly uh he may be a little late i'll send him an email but uh we'll go ahead and get started with uh while we're waiting we can go ahead and he's it's gonna he's gonna be six hours ahead of us, so he's probably not gonna have his own beverage. So we'll go ahead and jump into our uh, beverage review. All right. So I'll let you go first while I shoot him a. Uh, All right. Email. There, I do hear the lawnmower behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you hear lawnmowers, the <laughs> landscaping crew decided to wait till right before our podcast to show up today. Yeah. All right. So I went back to uh, the old HEB here in Texas and perused the shelves. So uh, looking for some local brews again after I've kind of done my national tour with uh, with Ca Craft Beer Company, the original Craft Beer Company uh, yep. club. But um, I went to the, back to the full grown series. Right. So I've had this on a few times, the full grown man the full-grown saint nick all those different full-grown things this is the full-grown scallywag scallywag so this is an imperial stout um and it has coconut and vanilla in it and uh, so the the definition of a scallywag is a person who behaves badly but in an amusingly mischievous rather than harmful way so mm. I would consider myself on some days a scallywag. <laughs> I can I can get behind that. <laughs> and uh, this clocks oh, in cool. at yeah, scallywag McCool. Um, this clocks in at a twelve point one percent ABV. So great, we'll see. very cool. Yeah. 
All right. So what I have is I'm going to be real quick because I don't want to le- let uh, Patrick wait too long. He just chimed into the green room. Cool. I've got a Highland Brewing High Pines Imperial IPA. Yes, I do have an IPA today. So, um, you know, that's it's getting uh, kind of limited. That time of year. Fine. You know, you uh, these warmer as it gets to be spring and summer. That's all you see on the shelf. So, uh, oh, nice. Like yeah. That. Yeah, I mean, when I was rolling through the store, the grocery store, the beer section, uh, there's a lot of IPAs and there's a lot of very fruity type stuff. Looks like that's going to be the the thing this year. So we've tried some of those with great failure in the past. So we'll have to see if pull a few of those, uh, you know, lots of seltzers, lots of hard seltzers, hard whatever. Yep. Um, so a lot more fruity stuff looks like coming out again this year. So we'll have to have to navigate through that. <laughs> But yep. In the meantime, Cheers. I've got me a, I've got me a uh, nice stout. I love it. Looks great. So here we go. So I tell you what, Sean, we'll do since he's waiting. We'll do our review yeah. after the fact. Yeah, and uh, we'll go ahead because he's six hours ahead. It's late. It's probably what? What is it? Like ten o'clock or six hours later? Probably. Yeah, ten. <laughs> what time? I don't even know what time it is now. <laughs> <laughs> it's after 10 okay so yeah we'll let him uh we'll let him jump in and uh we pull him up from the green room patrick gentlemen hey going, buddy? hey this is probably your like this is like your new green room right it's kind of like everything's gone virtual for the last years <laughs> like it's been, the way it's it is. been crazy but the good thing is i do most of these without any pants on so it uh <laughs> it, it makes it quite, quite convenient no fear, baby yeah, that's no right. Fear. I love that. Isn't it great where you can just uh, sit in front of a screen, not worry about uh, picking out your slacks or your pants? That's it. Or, <laughs> or playing tickets. Shirt, but I tell you, you, know, you work out enough. You're a pretty buff athlete. Athlete, You probably don't even need a shirt on right now. You go with it, around with a tank top. <laughs> You know, it depends on who's in your audience, whether or not the shirt comes off. But <laughs> shit, if I if I was like Sean drinking the twelve point eight percent, it probably would be off about halfway through. <laughs> it's possible. So before you I'll, came on, obviously we tell everybody you 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 might not have a beverage. So Sean and I went ahead and jumped in. But well, you may have one. Looks like you've got. You look at yeah. there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. So here's the here's the issue. Uh, you guys are the devil, clearly. <laughs> because as a good Irish Catholic kid or Irish Catholic Buddhist, as I'd probably refer to myself, I give up drinking for Lent, except for Patty's Day, of course. But I'm drinking a, a session IPA from uh, Brew Dog, which is only 3.8%. So it's not really drinking. Yeah, I, yeah that didn't even count. That's so, a, that's... see, Sean, we persuaded him yeah. to have a beer. It was the fear of like uh, not fitting in. That was probably the fear that was kicking in there. I'm, there were there are numerous fears kicking in, but I'm about I'm having a little a little liquid courage, so it'll be okay. There you go. All right. Well, we're excited right. to have you on, Patrick. Um, I don't know if Jonathan, you got a bio queued up, but I was going Absolutely. through your homepage and I, I didn't know what to pick from. So hopefully, <laughs> Jonathan's got something amazing. So uh, we've already up. given a little uh, a little. Um, snippet of your background before you came on there, Patrick. But uh, we've mentioned your book. We were talking about that. I've actually had a chance to uh, read through it and it is fantastic. I've gotten about halfway through it this morning, just alone. So it's really wow. cool. Wow. Um, Excellent. So you are known, Patrick Sweeney, our guest today, is dubbed as the fear guru for his work with over 500 glo- global CEOs, actors, professional athletes, Navy SEALs, and corporations. He inspires uh, a lot of people each year through his keynote speeches. Probably not a whole lot going right now, mostly virtual, like he said. Yep. But uh, we're uh, we're pleased to have you on. He, you also lecture at leading universities from Harvard Business School to the University of Virginia. And um, so we're pleased to have you on, man. Sean was also mentioned earlier that you're uh, you've competed in Olympic. Um, what did you say, Sean? Yeah, yeah. Two, two Olympic trials, right? Rowing, yep. yes. World in the Cup. in the single skull and rowing, yeah. Three years in the World Cup and uh, two Olympic trials, yeah. Wow. So I I got to know, like, rowing has got to be one of the most difficult, like, cardio things out there. Like that and the aerosol bike are like just beast. <clears throat> so 
Do you still work out like on a like a Concept Two rower type rower, or do you have? I, I do. So I have uh, I split my time between uh, Boston and where I am now in uh, Chamonix, France, and I've got a a rowing machine. I still have my rowing shells from the Olympic days in Boston, and uh, uh, Concept Two rowers are just they're they are <clears throat> absolute hell. Right. Yeah. Every, every rower hates them because, you, you know, you're usually in a sweaty field house someplace where, you know, horrible yeah. no breeze. air to breathe, dusty and, and you're pulling till you puke your guts out. So uh, they don't well, they don't they don't harbor fond memories. Yeah. What was your distance? So um, we had to test the Olympic distance and to get into training camps and that sort of thing was a 2000 meter uh, test. And we did right. different things during different parts of the the year but mostly our our consistent test was 2000 meters so i gotta know because i've done a 2000 meter test and that's probably the w single worst fitness benchmark i think i've ever done as far as a test right it's just like that it's kind of like running an 800 in track it's just yeah that distance that's just it just kind of sucks so what's your what's your best time on the 2000 on like a concept too so, yeah. So Sean, I, I gotta, I gotta agree with you because it's, you, you know, it, it's a bizarre race and especially on the water where you start out sprinting, like it was mm -hmm. the finish. So you can see everyone who's behind you, but, uh, it's too short to, uh, to be a sprint. I mean, sorry, it's too long to be a sprint and it's too short to be an endurance. So it's just, yeah. it's, uh, you know, a, a bunch of pain. I was never really good on the, on the erg in terms of, you know, like some of these, some of these really big, strong guys who may yeah. not have the best technique, uh, who just crushed it. But my, my personal best was uh 559. So it was, uh, it was a, you know, a big deal to break six minutes. And, you know, once I did that, I, I figured good enough. <laughs> yeah. I think I broke seven minutes once and that just about just killed enough. me. Like the quads, like you just fall off the thing. Cause the quads are like that. 10 to 20 seconds after you're done when that blood and lactic acid just like rushes is some of the worst pain I've ever felt. It's crazy. Oh, that in the, and if, if you want to know what it's, what it's like, so I've had a near death experience from leukemia and the closest thing I think you can get to that experience is like the last 15 seconds of a 2000 meter race or a 2000 meter erg where you just, get in this tunnel vision, everything's going black. You're, you, you know, you, you can't feel anything. And then yeah, literally you just, you just fall off the machine. Oh, wow. That's, that's Not pretty. Crazy. Yeah. So let's Man. talk about the Spanish inquisition. <laughs> <laughs> Before I, I got to mention this too, this is really impressive. You're the only person to ever summit, uh, Mount Kilimanjaro and Everest Base Camp by, uh, by Bicycle, also what, Elbrus too? Is Elbrus, which is Europe's highest mountain. That was probably the funnest uh, ride down of any mountain bike I've That's had. That's incredible. But yeah, just, just, doing, just finding ways to push myself and you know doing stupid stuff that no one else is dumb enough to do. Cool. You're, wow. like, a, you're like an action hero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah do, you, do you have your own doll? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I've got someone that, trying to design a cape for me. <laughs> yeah, I was going to look in the store to see if there's a uh, if there's a Patrick doll there we can get. Sweeney doll. This is awesome. Sweeney man. Well, Sweeney man. Well, thanks for coming on. Let's talk about, uh, let's jump right into your book. So we want to talk about, uh, first things first, is fear is fuel. So I've had a chance to go through, I got it on Kindle. Uh, why don't you... Tell us a little bit about yourself, something that we haven't mentioned. There's probably one, uh, there's probably an athletic event or a, a hobby that you haven't done. We haven't mentioned that you want to mention on here and uh, tell us about your background in the corporate world as well. Well, Sean, I think, um, you know, the, the key thing isn't, isn't the, the stuff that I've done. I've had some amazing opportunities in my life, but I think the, the, the thing that I'm probably most proud of is um, the fact that I saw a plane crash when I was six years old and that, that planted this whole seed of terror inside wow. me. And I became just a, a complete scaredy cat kid. I was, I was totally afraid of everything, afraid of bullies, afraid of, you know, my grandfather and my, my uncles and uh, you know, I was afraid of everything and especially afraid of flying. So after seeing this plane crash, we were supposed to go down to Atlanta for our first family trip. I grew up in uh, blue collar suburbs of, of Boston, you know, pretty typical first generation Irish immigrant upbringing. 
And, um, and we, when we got to the airport, we got to Logan airport. I saw the, the tail of a Delta plane, which is what I saw in the plane crash, uh, on TV. And I just freaked out. And we, uh, we ended up getting kicked out of Logan airport and, uh, uh, you know, my parents had no choice but to drive the 14 hours down to Atlanta. Uh, and I still hear about it to this day. But um, <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I told my parents we we're going to move to France. And of course, my dad, he's like, geez, Patty, that's a that's a mighty long drive there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so uh, uh, growing up, you know, and, and having this fear and, and all the shame associated with it and and trying you know, growing up in a culture where you just couldn't show any fear because it was weakness. And, and, you know, if, if you cried or if you're afraid of something, you're just a pussy and everyone's going to look down on you. And so I had that sort of shame mindset the whole time. So I was really feeling terrible about myself, but I was missing out on all these opportunities. And I figured, you know, maybe with athletics, I could find some courage and some self-confidence and that worked, but only on the water, right? Only when I was in the rowing shell did I really feel super confident. And then I thought, well, if I made a lot of money, my goal after that was 40 by 40. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make myself a net worth of $40 million by the time I was 40 years old wow. and screw, screw everything else. I'm going to just, you know, do whatever it takes to do that. And, uh, uh, and that just led to such a toxic lifestyle that I woke up one morning with a terrible pain in my arm and uh, wanted, should have gone to the doctors, but didn't because like everything else, I was afraid to, right? So I was afraid of what he might tell me and instead waited a few days until I could barely move and went to see the doctor and they said, we don't know what's going on, but you've got no white blood cells. So you've got no immune system. We can't treat it here. This is, I was living in Virginia at the time. We, we can't treat it rest in hospital. We're going to send you up to Johns Hopkins, best hospital in the world. They'll sort you out. Yeah. And the, the doc comes in after all these tests and everything else. And he said, listen, uh, you know, I hope your affair is in order and you should probably say your goodbyes. And, wow. and, and I'm just thinking, holy shit. And, and at that point, I was hit with this incredible sense of regret, right? I look back on my, on my life. I was 35 years old look back on my life and I thought, fuck, I've, I just wasted everything. I, you know, it took me six beers to get on a plane to go to Europe to race in the World Cup. My coach called me and he said, look, you're you know, one of the few Americans is ever going to race the World Cup. It should have been one of the best days of my life. Instead, I had a panic attack because it meant I had to fly to Europe. Right? So yeah. it was, you know, my, my whole life was like that. And I had a daughter who was one years old, one year old, and uh, my my wife was six months pregnant with our second one. And here I am thinking, that's it, that's the end of it. And had this operation. Woke up in the middle of the night after the operation. Tried to go to the bathroom, and that's when I sort of had the the whole tunnel vision, the white light, and everything else. And and went out, you know. And I thought, fuck, I'm dying. This this is what death is like, and and this is what it feels like, and. You yeah. know, and, and I haven't, I haven't ever even lived. And so when I came to and they, they, you know, I was alive and I realized, oh my God, it's so great to be alive. And I started using some of the uh, visualization techniques from the Olympic training center to, to try and help heal myself. And the doctors were doing all sorts of experimental stuff. They found this, uh, this guy is researcher in Penn state who discovered the kind of leukemia I had. And, you know, by the grace of God and by those good doctors and through that visualization, I, you know, got out obviously. <laughs> and so wow. when I did, the first thing I, I said is I'm going to overcome this fear of flying and I'm going to start taking private pilot's lessons, even if I'm kicking and screaming and, and crying for every lesson. And I did. And the first two or three were just horrific, right? I mean, I, I literally, like the first one, I peed maybe five or six times before we even got out to the plane. The second one, you know, we were flying over the Blue Ridge Mountains and we hit some turbulence in this little uh, two-seater two plane. And I think I pooped myself just, just <laughs> like a little bit, not a lot. And, uh, uh, but then an amazing thing happened. I fell in love with flying. And it mm. became one of my best, you know, my greatest passions, the biggest challenge. I got my private license, my instrument rating, my commercial rating, my seaplane rating. And now I fly a stunt <clears throat> plane, right? I compete yeah. in aerobatics. And, I, and, and it just blew my mind that on the other side of my fear was this amazing dream and something that had been hidden from me for 35 years. So that led to me asking all these neuroscientists and psychologists how my brain could change so much. And when I discovered all this stuff that was really 
high, you know, it was very scientific speak, a lot of research, a lot of, you know, big complex words. I said, people should know about this and I'm going to put it in plain language and, and give people concrete steps. And that's what led to the book, which is, um, uh, Jonathan, if you haven't seen the audio version, I'll make sure I get you a copy of that because okay. a lot of people I talk about in the book are in the auto audio version, which just released two weeks ago. So at the sure. end of each chapter, we've got an expert from this reclusive Texas billionaire who's never given an interview like this before to uh, you know professional athletes and Navy SEALs. But they come in at the end of each chapter, and it's really cool stuff. So uh, I'll make sure I get you that. But that's the that's the genesis of the book, and that's how all this started. Fantastic. Is that on Audible? <clears throat> it is on Audible, yeah. Cool. Hey, I've got a credit. Ready to go. So, right how on. much research did you talk about in 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 reading the book? You you do uh, reference a lot of the neuroscience part of overcoming fear. So, how much research went into this book before you uh, started actually writing it? Well, before we go there, I, wanna, I just want to just yeah. for context for listeners, um, the subtitle we haven't mentioned the subtitle. I think that'll give some context too. Oh yeah, the surprising power to help you find purpose, passion, and performance. I love that it's alliterated. You know, Jonathan mm -hmm. and I grew up in Southern Baptist area so like yep. you know everything had to be a three-point alliterated sermon <laughs> there you so, go uh, i love it yeah so the surprising power to help you find purpose passion and performance that's what was it. your question what was your question jonathan to, oh yeah to? talk about the re some of the research some of the uh research in the neuroscience aspect of the book that went into uh writing this so the, the first neuroscientist I ran into, I was doing a charity bike ride, 100 mile bike ride on Mother's Day in Boston. And this is seven years ago now, this this Mother's Day. And I just started asking him questions. You know, when you, you do those charity things after 20 or 30 miles, you kind of get in with a group at the same speed. And so we were together for a couple hours and, and he said, you know, come into the lab, I'll show you what we're doing. And uh, he was at Tufts University. And I said, this stuff's really fascinating. Um, and we had talked about PTSD and um, uh, he said, oh, you got to go to uh, to see Scott Orr at Harvard. He's doing some amazing stuff. And and Scott said, oh, you should see Mo Malad. He's, you know, he's doing this stuff. Mo said, you should go to MIT and, and talk to Anna Byler. She's just done the first map of how valence works. And so it, it started first in Boston with probably seven or eight different neuroscientists. And then the the net just kept expanding and I kept trapping in these neuroscientists who weren't used to talking to normal people, <laughs> as it turned out. And, uh, and it was just incredible. So uh, at the end of the day, it was six years of research before I started writing 35 sure. wow. neuroscientists from uh, University of Geneva, University College London, Trinity in Dublin, Stanford, Harvard, MIT, NYU, uh, all these amazing researchers around fear and, and courage. And um, so it, it was just an incredible journey and in talking to these people. And some of the neuroscientists are so far out there. Like one of my favorites is this guy, Carl Friston. And Carl is like, he's out of central casting. He's got this heavy London accent. He's got a pipe, <laughs> you know, he, see, he sits yeah. there kind of chewing on the pipe in a, in a Sherlock Holmes kind of way. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll ask him that my MO was, he, he hardly ever takes, um, takes appointments because he's in such demand. He was on the cover of Wired Magazine as sort of the key to artificial intelligence. The, the, his papers have been cited more times than Einstein's. So, so that oh, wow. tells you how smart this guy is. I'd go into his lab and, and I'd, say, I'd say, Carl, you know, here's the question I want to understand about how we form prior beliefs. He'd talk for 45 minutes and I, I wouldn't understand a damn thing. <laughs> and and I'd, I'd ask him maybe one more question. He'd talk for another 45 minutes. I was record, you know, I've recorded all of this and, and videoed all of it as well. And I'd go home and I just sit down on the couch literally for like two or three days playing it over and over again until I could figure out what he meant and, and get it into, uh, you know, in, into words that people could understand. So it was, it was incredible journey. And I learned so much and I really felt like these people were doing such important research, but it was going to, to journals and to academic papers that no one's ever going to read. Normal people wouldn't read. So, uh, so yeah, it was really fun. Six years, 35 neuroscientists wow. and a lot of time in seat 21 B. Well, I want to, um, cause I know you're also like a motivational, inspirational speaker, but I want to, I want to make sure our listeners understand, like, 
Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Patrick, but fear is fuel. And with the title and everything, it could sound like a very like self-help type book, but you go deep into neuroscience from what I'm hearing. And even, even that, I don't think people, most people realize how new neuroscience, like the real study of neuroscience is, uh, compared to most other fields of, you know, science and, and same with positive psychology, those two are starting to come together, but yeah. Can you speak a little bit about that so people know this is this is not just like rehashed stories or information and stuff. This is like this is new stuff. Like that we're just it's, learning it's, about how to make our brains do what we want them to do, right? It, it's funny, Sean, you say that because uh, there's some information that I put in the book that hasn't even been released yet because in the academic world, um, the research has to be peer reviewed. Right. So before they can publish something in a in a paper, it has to go to 25 of their peers. They have to comment on it. They have to rewrite the paper. So there's a bunch of research in the book that hasn't even been released. But a, a great example of this is we didn't have a complete map of the brain until 2016. And, and that's the first time that neuroscientists and psychologists could agree to all the different areas. I mean, that was only five years ago. And, oh, wow. and and we're talking about the the thing that has the most impact on our life. It's it's the smallest organ. It's only about three percent of our body, but it mm -hmm. uses twenty to twenty five percent of our energy and oxygen. So the the brain is such an incredible organ, <clears throat> and and we're only just now starting to realize it. And it has such a huge impact in our happiness, in our performance, and what we're passionate mm -hmm. about. And, and for your listeners, especially guys, it, it has a, an incredible, easy to understand impact on persuasion and how we do the things, we, how and why we do the things we do. And once you understand the neuroscience, the reason I go into the neuroscience is because it's, you know, it's like learning to, to fix a car. If, if your car breaks down and you think, well, you know, I turn the key, it starts and I press the pedal and it goes, then when you sit by the side of the road, you're screwed, right? And you're going to wait for mm -hmm. a tow truck. And right. But if you know that, you know, when I turn the key, it closes a circuit to the battery, the battery starts the starter engine, the starter turns the crankshaft, it shoots gas in, mixes it with air, boom, boom, boom. And you can kind of figure things out. Then you have an understanding of what might, what might be going wrong and what might be right. It's the same thing with our brain. If we can start to understand how the brain works, because we're running this 2 million year old piece of software, literally mm -hmm. 2 million years old is the programming on our fear center called the amygdala. It's a little almond shaped gland at the at the base of our brain and every decision we make if you think about it can be distilled down to either a choice of fear or a choice of opportunity and at the end of the day if you look back on all your decisions when you made it a choice out of fear that usually leads to regret and to shame and to failure when you make a choice out of opportunity that's what leads to success and growth and and performance and and you know new breakthroughs which is what we all want to do yeah and and i'm curious about what you found out about cuz the circumstance could be the same right i mean yeah you know getting on a plane could be terrifying and cause fear and then you know you everything you see on the plane makes you even more scared or whatever, like, you know, all kinds of things. And then, but at the same time, it could be an opportunity to go do a new business deal or whatever. And so what are they learning? Cause we've, we've all heard about the amygdala, especially, you know, people that are into a lot of our listeners are into marketing and persuasion. They understand that, that part of it, but what are we learning? That's new maybe from what we, is there a way to control that? Cause it seems like, okay, this is this little almond sized thing, but then we've got this other, you know, all these other parts that we're now learning about. Yeah. How do we, how do we take more control over that instead of it letting it be so responsive? Well, I think, I think the first thing is a, a willingness to, to try and understand what's going on. Just, just what you're asking about now, having that curiosity of saying, look, how, how can I change that? And knowing you have the ability, and, and this is what neuroscientists call agency, excuse me, you've got the ability to change things that are in your control. And, and so once you understand that and you think, hey, I understand there's something called neuroplasticity. And mm -hmm. neuroplasticity means we can change our brain at any age. So if you want to get more creative, you can at any age. If you want to get also more- a, a rel That's relatively new understanding as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. So it's the this is research within the past five to seven years that's shown 
the size and 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 the lo the um, connections to different the amygdala, the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, those can all change at any age. So people who say who have this fixed mindset, you know, who say I'm I'm not, uh, you know, I can't speak another language. I'm afraid to fly. I don't like heights. <clears throat> they're they're choosing that option. So mm -hmm. once you become aware that you don't have to choose that option, you can, uh, humans are one of the only animals that can choose our response to things. And, yeah. and if we choose fear, if we continue to say, I'm in that fixed mindset, we're just hitting a wall on our road to success and to happiness. If you choose opportunity, as uncomfortable as it is, what your body does when, when you feel fear is we have this fear response and, and we, we make a fear cocktail, right? We start to produce all these enzymes, these, these hormones, uh, DHEA, adrenaline, cortisol, and, and that, that manifests itself in a change in our body, right? We'll feel butterflies or sweaty palms or our mouth will get dry. But what that's also doing is it's putting more oxygen and blood into the brain. It's increasing our ability to take in data with our eyes and our ears. It's shutting out anything unnecessary. So our, our physical strength and our mental acuity get a lot better. So this is why I tell people we've got to scare ourselves every day. Because once you get used to that feeling, then it doesn't become a, a harbinger of fear. You start to think, okay, I've got an opportunity. My body's telling me I've got an opportunity to make a choice, to do something courageous. And then there's a part of our brain that they recently discovered called the SGACC, the subgenial anterior cingulate cortex. And that's our courage center. So mm -hmm. if we realize that we have a courage center, the problem is, here's, here's the really big challenge, the amygdala, is fully developed at birth. The SGACC isn't fully developed until we're in our early 20s. So from birth, we're, we're ready to fight, flight, or freeze. We're ready to survive, do whatever it can we can to survive. That's a very strong instinct. It's the oldest part of our brain, and that's what we default to. Right, and, and this is why kids, you know, scream and yell, and and they start to flip out. It's 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 because the amygdala is fully developed. So that becomes our default becomes defense. We we yeah. take that fear choice. We have to work to wire those connections to the SGACC. And one of the first ways to do it, Sean, to to more a very practical, easy thing that anyone can use is when you start to feel those changes in your body, you breathe. And the method that I talk about in the book is called a four by four. And you mm -hmm. breathe in for a count of four. So you go, you hold it for a count of four. You breathe out for a count of four. And then you hold it out for a count of four. So basically Navy SEALs call this box breathing and they're taught mm -hmm. it at, at sniper camp. But Here's the neuroscience behind why that works so well. So as soon as you start to feel the, those fears, just doing a couple, just doing a couple of those four by fours immediately releases the amygdala's grip on your sympathetic nerve system. And the way it does it is we, we have two ways of taking in data into our brain, what's called top down. And that's all the data we bring in from our eyes and our ears and external sources. Mm -hmm. We also have bottoms up. So if we start that nice, steady breathing, our mind says, oh, we're not breathing short and fast. We're not under stress. We must not be under a threat. So it shuts off that, that fear response. So breathing, which yogis have done for thousands of years is probably right. the simplest way that you, that you can start to attack the fear. So in the book, I outline a, a, a method called the BASE method, B-A-S-E. And I'll hit on the S too, because that's super easy and anyone can do it. S stands for two things. One is smile. So, so one of the things they found out at Emory University, they took 2000 subjects, they split them in half and they made them watch horror movies and measured their stress hormone level, the cortisol level. They gave half the group a chopstick and they said, take this chopstick, put it in, your, in between your teeth, like that, and flex the, flex the muscles in your face that you use to smile. They didn't tell them to smile because they didn't want them to think of something good or positive. They just said, flex those muscles. And the other half of the group just watched the movies. They measured the cortisol. The ones who smiled, who had the chopstick in their mouth had an 80% lower cortisol level. Wow. 
Wow, so that wow. old adage, grin and bear it, works like a charm. <laughs> so if you can, if you can think, you know, I'm just going to smile. I'm going to grin and bear it. Then it, there's actually scientific research behind why that works. So those those are two quick little things, Jonathan. That's that, incredible. That yeah. Use. So I'm curious, like, so how do you, I guess, you know, a lot of people are way, you know, even if our, you know, our cortex, those areas are developed at 21, 25, whatever they are, they still got to be trained, right? Because the, yeah. the default yeah. has been, you know, your amygdala for so long. The defense, yep. So great. Box breathing is a great idea. Smiling is a great idea. How do you train yourself to remember to do that? in the, in the time. Right. Cause it's, it's one thing to say, yeah, I know that if I do that, it'll help. It's another thing to like start training yourself to even remember to do that in a state of fear. Well, and that's it. So, so the first thing comes with what you said, and that's having that belief and that desire that you want to change. If mm -hmm. you believe in neuroplasticity, if you understand the science then, and you've got the desire to change, you'll start to recognize those fear tells. And, and that's why I tell people to do it proactively, Sean. So the reason I say in the book, scare yourself every day, and, and you don't have to jump out of a plane. You can, you can do something as silly as, you know, standing up in, uh, uh, in front of people at lunch and making a toast or, or uh, you know, asking some stranger at the gym out for a coffee or wh whatever it is, it doesn't matter what you do. It just has to be something outside of your comfort zone so that you know you're doing something proactively outside your comfort zone. You'll recognize those changes in your body. You'll feel that your heartbeat's starting to increase, your respiration's starting to get quicker. And, and because you're doing it, you're proactively saying, I'm going to put myself outside my comfort zone and I'm going to get used to it. What you're doing is you're wiring that connection to the SGACC. And those neurons that, that fire together will wire together. So the more it's like walking a path in the snow, you know, the first time you're post holing and it's tough and you're digging it. And then you walk the path again and it's a little bit easier. You walk it again. It's a little bit easier. And you've walked this path in the snow enough times, then it becomes really easy to access that courage center. And that was one thing I found after I started taking flying lessons, I, the, the courage effect had, the courage just had this halo effect across my whole life. My relationships got a lot better. I was working a lot less hours, but my, my business <clears throat> really took off and became incredibly successful. And, and I was just living an amazing life. And a lot of it became because I was starting to learn how to access that courage center. So the big thing I'd say, Sean, is, is having the desire to, to do that and, and having the understanding that if you're curious and you have the belief you can change your, your brain and your mindset, then absolutely you can do it. All right. So I've got an idea for you. You may already have this idea because you're a pretty smart guy, but uh, I think as a follow-up to the fears. My kids fears, don't think so. <laughs> well, they, they don't count. I've got two. Jonathan has two teenagers. Mine are both grown. Like, uh, yeah. Um, you need like a, a 365 days of fear journal with one of those actions, like standing up, making a toast at lunch, like every day that you could follow. That'd be a really That's cool follow up to the book. I'll take, yeah, just send me the royalties. <laughs> I'll get you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, you know what I do have that's, that's actually really fun. Uh, on the website, I've got a fear test and yeah, uh, all that. it's about five minutes to do it. It's free. It's, it takes about five minutes. And, and basically the idea is that you, uh, there's nine categories of fear. So we've got finance and relationship and physical fear. And so, so we've got nine different categories there. And, um, it, it, the idea being that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So you mm -hmm. take the test and you look at areas where you're weak and you think, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, here's, here's financial stuff. I've always put my money in bonds and everyone's making money off of Bitcoin. This, this week I'm going to, I'm going to put a grand in Bitcoin and see how it goes. And, you know, you, yeah. you'll, you'll have all sorts of consternation about it and everything else, but then you do it and you start to realize, but I love the, the 365 days of fear. I'll have to, uh, <laughs> Give that some thought because I, I got, you know, in the past three months, I've had 2000 people do that fear test sure. and people will send me, you know, they'll say, Hey, I, I'm, I'm really bad in this and really bad in that. What can I do? And I keep thinking to myself, God, there's gotta be a, you know, there's gotta be something I can do as sort of a there's, follow -up. some. There's another book. You probably wouldn't have to be 365. I just, I got the daily stoic the other day. So it made me think of it too, but, um, yeah. there's another book, um, 
from that movie Fireproof, Love Dare. And it was like a 40 day yeah. thing where you did something with your marriage every day to try to make your marriage stronger, oh, which nice. any of those, any of those would be fear. So like, you know, yeah, like <laughs> yeah. a 40, like a 40 day challenge. I mean, anything in that range, you know, anything like that would yeah. be, would be kind of cool for sure. Um, I want to get back to like, so the actual fear is fuel. You've kind of hint, you've kind of gone towards it. And in my brain, the first thing I thought of when you were talking about like, getting yourself, making yourself scared. It's almost like, um, you were talking about the cocktails and all the, you know, all the chemicals that happen and the, the benefits of those as well. Um, yeah. it made me think of like a pre-workout, you know, like the pre-workout drinks. Right. So it's kind of like yeah. your pre-workout yeah. for the day is to, to get a little fear stirred up. Um, but let's, let's kind of go a little bit deeper into that fears fuel and how we said the thing right before you came on, this particular episode about persuasion would probably be more about self persuasion than anything. Um, which is very important to get you to go out and market your book or market your services or market a product or anything else. Cause those all have fear barriers, right? Yeah. Oh, sure. So talk a little bit more about specifically how you translate the fear into fuel to get whatever done you want to get done in a day. Well, you know, I, I think the key thing, I, I love the idea of the, the pre-workout uh, drink, you know, having, having that fear it, it to pump you up because there's so many, um, and uh, I'll bring the Stoics into it as well, because there's something in the book I suggest that I've done uh, for years. I actually learned it. Um, Jonathan, if you haven't gotten to chapter six yet, that's a, it's a great one about the Olympic Training Center. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was at the Olympic Training Center, this guy, Shane Murphy, who we actually interview, he's at the end of the chapter. So we brought him in. He was the uh, sports psychologist at the U.S. Olympic Training Center for 15 years. So he's in it. He's he's worked with thousands and thousands of Olympic gold medalists, uh, you know, national champions, everyone else. And so I went out there for the first time uh, in my first Olympic trials. I finished 14th and I really felt horrible. I had I had just incredible nausea launching my boat. I was bobbling all over the place. I, it, it was like, you know, I couldn't even walk, uh, being a, being a three-year-old kid after spending years training and getting ready for this moment. So I knew it was, it was all mental and, uh, ended up finding a new coach. There's a great story behind that, but found the coach. He, ended up getting me out to the Olympic training center to work with Shane and work with some of the sports uh, physiologists out there as well. So Shane puts me in this, in this giant egg shaped chair and it's a um, it's got like 15 speakers inside of it. And it's really comfortable as you're like, you know, just below ambient air body temperature. And so it's the perfect environment to, to do hypnosis or, or um, you know, visualization. And the first two or three times, it's exactly what you expect. You know, he's, he's counting down. He starts a body scan. So relaxing your head, relax your eyes, your jaw. You're getting heavier. Mm -hmm. You feel like butter melting on a hot stove. You're sinking into that nice support. And so you're in this, you know, all of a sudden you feel a little bit like you're floating above your body and it's kind of an awesome feeling. He said, now you're having the race of your life. It's a perfect start. The water's calm. I'm like, oh man, this kicks ass. <laughs> See yourself on the podium at the end. And uh, so all this stuff. So we do that for like four or five days and we have, have this amazing visualization. I'm like, oh, I'm really digging this. And the neuroscience behind it is when you visualize, we produce, we create two memories. We create a semantic memory, which is just the facts. And we create an emotional memory. They're stored in two different places in your brain, but even visualization is stored the exact same way. So we can't, our brain can't tell the difference between something that really happens and something that we visualize happening. The only difference is if it, if it really happens, there's usually more of an emotional yeah. component. So it's stored as a stronger memory, but, but basically the, the mechanism, and we just learned this in the past really three years that we're storing memories like this and we have to access them within a certain amount of time as well. But then what happened was on the fourth day or the fifth day, I'm in my mind floating above, everything's going great. And he's like, you just hit a buoy and your boat's bobbling. You took on water and you went from first place to last place. I'm like, dude, what's the F? <laughs> I'm supposed to be winning these races. And, uh, and he said, okay, now you're, you're looking around, you're feeling really scared. And you're, you're starting to row. You take a start again. Your boat's feeling balanced. Now you're picking it back up. You realize you're catching up on them. 
So he does what the Stoics have called the premeditation of evil. Mm -hmm. And the premeditation of evil is thinking about the worst thing that could possibly happen. And, right. and you think about, you visualize and you imagine these terrible things happening. And so I always, you know, when, once he got me trained up, I'd always think about the worst thing that happened. And I was actually in Lucerne, Switzerland at a World Cup one time, and, and it was the semifinals. And I was doing great. And there was an official's boat that was coming the other direction, was going too fast, threw a wake, literally sent water splashing over my gunnel, you know, upset the boat. I was knocking my oars around a little bit. And I just, I started laughing because, because I said to myself, man, this is like, this is a, a Shane Murphy moment come true. <laughs> and, yeah. and it was having that kind of premeditation of evil. So let's go back to the, the pre-workout drink. You yeah. sit down and you're about to make a, a big presentation at work, you know, you're going to, you're, or you're pitching a venture capitalist or you're doing whatever. Take that time and imagine the worst possible scenario that can happen. And what you'll do is you'll elicit your own fear response. You'll start to feel your heart rate ta taking off, your breathing getting quick. You'll probably feel heat change in, in your body and then start to do the breathing and see how you respond to it, right? And, and coach yourself that the biggest thing, Sean's, uh, Shane Murphy's biggest takeaway, I said, what, what's the one thing that you've seen in Olympic gold medalists that you haven't seen in everyone, anyone else? And he said, by far, it's self-talk. It's their ability mm. to, to talk to themselves and be their own internal coach. So if you get used to practicing being your internal coach and your internal cheerleader, when shit goes really sideways, then that's when you can start to do it in real life and you start to get into those situations. So thinking about the worst thing that could possibly happen during your day uh, is, is probably a great way to have that pre-workout uh, dose of fear. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I've, I've said for a while, you know, watching golf and things like that, that like a lot of these golfers, top level, you know, top five, top 10 golfers in the world, they still all make bad shots. Yeah, sure. Like on a regular basis, you're watching them on TV and they all make terrible shots, right? In the water, in the, in the pine straw, whatever. And it occurred to me, like the best golfers in the world are not perfect golfers. They have the best recovery yeah. after a bad <clears throat> shot which is both self-talk and some skill, you know, being able to come out. But it seems like and there's certain ones that kind of thrive on that. And they, they make these amazing shots out of the straw through six pine trees, you know, like <laughs> called the bank shot, like the whole yeah. bit. Like it's, it, so it's, that makes a lot of sense to, to do the fear. I saw a movie recently that, ha that had a character in it. I cannot remember for life me what it was, but that's how he prepared for whatever the big thing was going to be like he was he was walking through everything that could go wrong and how he would handle it yeah <clears throat> well, do you remember was. the story of the uh it was a po pow in vietnam he was a colonel got shot down and he was an avid golfer but he talking about that visualization yeah he would visualize every day playing golf as a as a prisoner of war yeah, on his home course yeah. he would go through the entire yeah and Sorry, it's amazing old. how he, like, even after all, I forget how many years he was a POW, but when he came back from all of the visualization that he did, he didn't miss a beat when he got back on the course. So, yeah. so Patrick, I'm curious, like, we've known about visualization for a long time. I mean, you can go back to psycho-cybernetics. I think mean, that's where, uh, you know, I mean, it goes way back before that if we get into some of the religious practices, things like that. But I think yeah. it kind of went mainstream with Maxwell Maltz and psycho, psycho cybernetics. Um, probably Dennis Waitley. If you go back to the Olympic training center, you know, yep. in the eighties, probably. So what's different now? Is it just that we know how more, how it works? So it's not just kind of anecdotal now. I mean, what's, what's the difference? I, I think that's a big part of it. And it's also the ability to measure it. So we've got mm. uh, the ability now to, to measure brain waves and to understand brain waves as well. And that's, that's had such an impact on performance. Uh, one of my favorite neuroscientists from MIT is a guy named Earl Miller. Earl's also uh, appears in the audio version of the book. And Earl's, Earl's done three or four different things. The, the, his first, the thing that made him famous, he's got one of the most I think he's got the third or fourth most cited uh, paper in neuroscience ever. He, he uh, disproved multitasking. 
So mm -hmm. he showed that there's no such thing as multitasking and there's a high cost to what he calls uh, multi-switching. So switching from one task to another and how much more efficient it is to multitask. The other thing uh, he's done a lot of work on is something called the working memory. Now, working memory is part of the prefrontal cortex and the way to think about it is if, if you have, if you can imagine your brain as a smartphone and you've got thousands and thousands of apps inside your brain, but you can only have one up on the screen at a time. And that, that screen or that phone is your working memory. So when the amygdala takes over, it puts the app up that says fight, flight, or freeze. And that's all that occupies our working memory. So we make single level decisions. We don't make a decision like a decision tree where we think, okay, if I do this, then I'll have this choice and that choice. If I do that choice, then this will happen, this will happen, or that'll happen, which is how you rationally want to make decisions, right? Multi-level decisions. When, when the amygdala takes over the working memory, it's fight, flight, or freeze. I'm just going to do one of these things right now. And I don't care about the consequences. I don't care what happens afterwards. So he came up with the ability of how we can change the working memory, how it works. He also came up with something that's really fascinating. And this, this uh, gets to not only visualization, but also how we play sports. And, and of course, the greatest quarterback of all time, Tom Brady, <laughs> was, was uh, one, of, one of Miller's subjects. So we actually have bandwidth in areas where we look in the world. So depending on where we move our eyes determines how much data we can take in. So literally you, you can find out that a, that a sniper or a quarterback or a golfer shouldn't look over here because he's yeah. not gonna get as much information as if he looked right here or right here. And, and so you can start to understand these things. So it's a, it's a long way, Sean, of saying that having the technology to measure some of the things that we'd do with visualization and to understand what brain waves do. So brain waves are another really fascinating subject because we used to think that we had brain waves because of activity that was going on. Think of it like exhaust from a car, right? We used mm -hmm. to think because an engine's running, there's gonna be exhaust fumes. And that's not the case. So we just found out in 2019, like literally two and a half years ago, that brain waves are traffic cops of when the neurons fire and the synapses connect together. So the, so the brain waves can determine which part of our brain we're gonna root information and energy to. Wow. So just having the ability to understand this stuff and the energy to measure it is really starting to change how sports psychologists, so when I work with, with athletes, I, I've worked with a lot of um, baseball players who've been injured and all of a sudden have this terrible slump because they're afraid to either get back in front of a, a ball or, or run close to yeah. the outfield fence. And they have this big fear and, and using some of this knowledge and some of the techniques and being able to measure it, you just, you, you know, sh shortcut the time to really good performance. So is that about on the brain waves? Is that about getting into a certain brain wave um, range to do certain tasks? So you you would visualize in one, you try to you know train in another, learn. Yeah. You know, so just... and and one of the big areas for that, Sean, is recovery. So so being able to go through a range of of brain waves and make sure that when you're either taking a nap or you're visualizing or you're sleeping at night that you hit those ranges of different brain waves ensures that we're able to do what neuroscientists call uh, consolidate our memories. And so, so fear extinction, as it's called, which is part of the PTSD process, when, when we can't name a fear, we can't categorize it. So you could think of fears as, mm. as each having a different label, like you're, you're trying to file away a book in a library. And if there's one that's unlabeled, because it, it caused so much trauma and there was so much damage, you know, the helicopter getting shot down or the IED going off and, and we don't understand that emotion and we can't characterize it. We can't extinguish that, that fear. We can't consolidate that memory and put it someplace. So it, it sort of stays floating up. And anytime something triggers that we have that fear response. So we're just starting to understand how those brain waves, how those connections work. And because we can, we can start to treat things like PTSD. And, and one of the things that we found out, and this, this ties all the research together, 
is remember we've got the semantic memory, just the facts. The IED, you know, it was a sunny day. We're in Kabul. The uh, the Humvee was me and Murph and you know whoever. And all of a sudden, uh, I'm ba being evacuated on a chopper and and I can't feel my leg. And so that's yeah. just the facts. And then you've got the emotional one that's associated with it. One of the things we've we've recently found out, and this is a, the guy I mentioned, Scott Orr is that we have about 10 minutes to change those associations. You can never change the semantic memory. You can never change the facts, but you can always change the emotional component that's associated with those facts. But one thing we found out is when you recall that memory, we've got about a 10 minute window to do that. So if you go to a psychologist for an hour and a half, you're wasting 80 minutes, basically, if you don't do yeah. something in that first 10 minutes. So sure. it's, it's really fascinating stuff and has had a huge impact on, on performance and, and also, you know, for, for your advertising listeners and that sort of thing on uh, persuasion and, and, and being able to exploit people as well. So it's, it's helpful if you know when you're being taken advantage of. <laughs> sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I do you use work this, with um, any, I'm just curious, do you work with any, have you worked with a lot of, I know you've worked with the military um, people in um, like special forces and stuff like that. Have you worked with people coming home from, uh, you know, Afghanistan, um, you know, Iraq and places like that that have had uh, post-traumatic uh, fear? I, ha I have. And, um, and, and it's interesting, Jonathan, because it's, it's not just uh, some of the more interesting people I've worked with and, and, you know, I've lectured and down at, at Fort Bragg at special operations command and, and some of the more interesting folks that, um, that have had issues haven't had anything to do with, with the type of PTSD that most people think. So a lot of it has to do with a loss of identity. So uh, a Navy SEAL or a Green Beret or a, a Parajumper coming home and all of a sudden uh, no longer being in the military, no longer being part of yeah. uh, his or her team <clears throat> and selling cars at the, you know, at the local car dealership or, or you know, teaching uh, science at, at the local high school or whatever, whatever their new job is. And they were, they were so attached to their last tribe and to their identity in that tribe. Now they feel like they're out in the wild mm. with no support and they really have a difficult time dealing with it. And this is why you, you know, you've often seen a lot of special ops uh, operators who end up having two or three broken marriages, you know, and, and difficulty with relationships and that sort of thing. So it's probably a not lot of the same with athlete professional athletes too. They come out of the NFL and they've transitioning after they've, you know, getting their forties, they they're going back to, uh, you know, just a regular life out, outside of athletics. Yeah. Going you know, from yeah. a team environment to a solo environment, yeah. you know, in both those situations would be, you know, very different. Pretty for tough. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've seen it with a lot of Olympic athletes, you know, um, there was an interesting study and this, this was, this is back in the nineties. Uh, they shared it with us at, at, uh, in Colorado Springs that, uh, they gave the survey to, I don't know, however many Olympic athletes. And they said, if you could take a pill that would ensure you'd win a gold medal in the next Olympics, but you'd die three years afterwards, would you do it? And I can't remember what the number was, but I was astounded when I heard wow. it. It was like 60 or 70 percent said, hmm. said they would. And what that tells or what that told me anyways, was they, they don't have an image or a vision for their life after the Olympics. They don't right. see it. They don't see it as as a step in their growth, a moment of their development, a, an incredible opportunity. They see it as an end goal. Mm -hmm. And, and that oftentimes is the case with, you know, with professional athletes, with, uh, um, people in the military and, and that sure. sort of thing. If they, if they've reached something, they've attained something they always dreamt about and then they lose it. And this is one of the huge persuasion things you guys have talked about before this, the idea of loss aversion, uh, about how much we value things that, you know, we already have versus what we can get that, that, uh, that loss hits them so hard. And this is what leads to you know, a, a ton of problems, whether it's substance abuse or difficulty in relationships or just health problems. And, and, uh, so I've, I've worked in, and, you know, I'm really yeah. passionate about helping people deal with that type of stuff. 
It reminds me a lot of uh, Simon Sinek, that the latest book that Sean and I have talked about, The Infinite Game. I don't know if you've had a chance to read. I haven't that seen it yet. I, obviously, you know that you know his work with Start with Why, which is fantastic yeah. stuff. Yeah, he's he's had a couple books since then. Last one's more yeah, taken like the the almost like not quite eternal, but like a long term, infinite yeah. perspective on business as opposed to this goal, this quarter by quarter stuff that's so rampant mm-hmm. now. I remember Eric Thomas too, um, motivational speaker, Eric Thomas, he talked about, he'd go into locker rooms with NFL guys and, you know, teams that were kind of down in the dumps. And, um, he's like, you know, the problem is all of you wanted to get to the NFL (laughs) and you got here and then you didn't have the next thing lined up. That's right. And it just creates this like stopping point because you hit it and then like, you just didn't reset, which, uh, Reminds me too of the sigmoid curve. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, Patrick, but it's a kind of a business term, but where you got to always have that next thing because everything's going to fade out eventually. So you got to kind of have your next thing to go to as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, Sean, one of my, in, in my second big company, which was, which was my most successful uh, company called Odin, we were the uh, first really RFID operating system, radio frequency identification. So the little chips that, that track things. And yeah. I bootstrapped the company. Um, so my the first company I had, Server Vault, I raised uh, $25, 30000000 million in venture capital and, and debt. And for oh, once I sold that, I had enough money to start my next company and uh, really wanted to do everything I could to keep the venture capitalists out and, and bootstrap it. One of the guys on my board is a, an incredible entrepreneur named Sanju Banzel. And Sanju and a guy named Mike Saylor started micro strategies and um and and they bootstrapped it to a multi-billion dollar company so they're both billionaires uh they created hundreds and hundreds of millionaires and sanju was on my board and we used to talk a lot about long-term success and and long-term goals and not you know not focusing on uh, the, this single contract that single contract and the idea that there are many many bets out there and there's yeah. never a one company sort of make the bet. And to their credit, uh, Michael and, and Sanju were one of the first companies to say, we're going to stop reporting quarterly numbers. So, uh, wow. so they said to Wall Street, you know, super successful uh, stock traded, well traded in a lot of hedge funds and, and, and uh, pension funds and that sort of thing. And they said, we're going to stop giving guidance and we're going to stop reporting our numbers. And, uh, and, you know, immediately the stock went like that for about, you know, 60 days or, or something. Yeah, and then it course. just continued, continued sure. to take off and they had a much better culture because of it. Right. Oh, oh, sure. For sure. No doubt. To work. Yeah. Um, one last thing, and then we'll get, uh, we're going to wrap up. We'll get your, also your rating on your beer, but this is a cool little device that I found. I don't know if you've seen this. It's Bellaby. It's actually the company's here in Austin where I'm at. And it's yeah. a, um, like you hook it up to your smartphone and it, it sends out pulses using your smartphone audio basically into your brain. And you can actually find like, I've got this chart of which brave wavelength you can actually program okay. it to hit different wavelengths. So if you're reading, if you're writing, mm-hmm. if you're trying to do meditation, like you can force the brain, you know, to go you can into train, that. You can train the brain. Yeah. Like halo. Right. Yeah. 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 There's, there's cool. a bunch of those devices. Yeah, there's a bunch there. of them now. Yeah. How much? Yeah. How much is that, Sean? This one's not bad. It's like one hundred fifty nine dollars, and it's actually like, it's. I want to go down there and help them market so bad. It's killing me. But like, <laughs> they really only market to like therapists, and I just happened to stumble across it. So they're not like in the consumer market. They're more in the therapy market. Yeah. Um. But yeah, you go into their app, and it's got like PTSD and like all these different like ailments. Um, because it is marketed therapist. So I've like, I've got created my, a couple of my own programs based on research, but yeah, any tool, it's amazing what's going to come out now that neuroscience is kicking up. Yeah. The biofeedback tools and, you know, the muse headsets, all that stuff that, that we're going to be able to um, manipulate, I guess a little bit um, the brain, since we now know how it works and can measure it and get feedback and all that, that it's, it's going to be amazing. I think over the next five to 10 years, yeah, with smartphone technology I, I and think, wearables. You know, one of the things, Sean, this is um, uh, COVID related. So the guy, Carl Friston, who I talked about, 
he's there's these Silicon Valley venture capitalists and and people from Apple and Google who see him every couple of weeks because he does this Monday class kind of uh, breakfast with Carl type of thing where he he invites people because he doesn't want to have individual meetings. So he invites everyone to sit in a classroom and he'll talk for 20 or 30 minutes and answer questions. And so people fly from all over to hear him uh, mm -hmm. talk about what, how AI should work. And he created this concept that uh, we have free energy. So the, the, sur the source of fear is basically uncertainty, right? Our brain's a prediction engine. We try and predict the outcome of everything that's going to happen. When we mm -hmm. can't, it creates uncertainty. That uncertainty makes us feel disempowered, right? And, and that's where the fear comes in, when we feel like we can't control something that's about to happen. That's a measurement that, that Carl created called free energy. So free energy is basically, you can think of it as fuel for, for creating fear and, and uncertainty and anxiety. And then he also talks about how we measure the the free energy and those levers we can pull in our own life. And so uh, he and I have been talking about something with, with Muse or maybe with that thing where we can measure the different levers and, and people can have it on their smartphone where if they're feeling fear, they can start to understand why and start to realize how to use that in, in the moment. So th there's fascinating stuff like that. And this year, I just uh, gave a talk a couple of weeks ago to, to another university and I said, look, all of the things that I've done about helping companies with their mental health during COVID, I see people bifurcating in one of two ways. And here's a scientific fact. Mice, when they're scared, freeze and do nothing. They wait for the, the threat to go away. Leopards, <laughs> when they're scared, they take immediate, deadly, and incredibly fast action. So half of the people that I've talked to in, in companies and associations over the past year are mice. They're sitting here waiting for COVID to be over. They're waiting for their vaccine. They're waiting for their PPP checks. They're, they're frozen. The other half who are the leopards, as soon as they take action, they're getting more data back. So something's right. changed. They've gotten more information. They, they act again. We're, humans are the only ones who have the choice to do that. So if we have some mechanism, whether it's a wearable device, whether you know it's it's something in a, on our smartphone, if we have some ability to to help us to catalyze people to take action and get more data back, that's going to do wonders for our mental health, and and that's that's one thing I'd love to keep investigating. Yeah, for sure. So it's free energy. Um, is it as measurable as something like heart rate variability? Not yet, but that's but that's, that's where goal. that's where this science is going. Yeah, and, and that's that would be really I'm hugely really interested in. Yeah, that'd yeah. be really cool. I mean, to to be able to your Whoop band or your Apple Watch to be able to measure like, oh, you're you're about to go <laughs> into like fear state, like a yeah. little alarm, a little you know notice pops off and says, hey, you know the the Breathe app comes up for box breathing. Yep, um, that'd be that'd be pretty cool. And you're, yeah. uh, I noticed on your t-shirts and stuff, and on your book, the leopard is your. Your mascot, right? <laughs> yeah, I thought you were talking about my Dropkick Murphy nah, shirt. <laughs> no, nah, I'm looking on the website. I see your you've got yeah, a yeah. Fierce yep. Jewel shirt in your store. Yeah. So very cool. Well, uh, Jonathan, unless you got anything else, look, we're about at time, so we'll wrap up. I could go all day on this stuff, man. Oh, me too. You you know you got a section in your book, and we're not going to get to it, but I would love to have. I've, Patrick, I do a couple of other industry specific podcasts in the uh, corporate world, and. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, chapter you've got on uh, creating a culture of courage and work. I would love to have you back on uh, one of my other podcasts, uh, you know, specifically for that industry to uh, talk about that chapter alone because it's good stuff. Well, well, Jonathan, there's there's two guys. You're going to love the audio book. So uh, I'm happy to do it. You know, let's yep. let's figure out what we're working in the schedule. Uh, if okay. I can keep having beers while I do it, then, then <laughs> sure. <laughs> what the well, hell? That, that one's an earlier show. So we'll be having coffee on that one. Well, there you, you go. won't be, but I will. Yeah, I might, I might not be. <laughs> well, so, yeah, there's two uh, there's two great interviews in the audio book. One is uh, that reclusive Texas billionaire I mentioned. The other is the CEO of, uh, he's been probably the most successful general manager and CEO of major league baseball teams. Uh, so oh, cool. both those guys are, are really cool info and we can talk about them on the podcast if you want. Good. Very Fantastic. cool. Well, uh, Patrick, where can people find out more about you? What's the best, best place to find out more about you? Sure. Uh, my website, PJ Sweeney, 
Com, S-W-E-E-N-E-Y. Uh, go there. The fun thing would be go take the fear test and, uh, yeah. and then you can start to measure your fear and manage it and, uh, and become more courageous. So that's a, a cool freebie there at, and uh, sign up for our newsletter. I do a blog every week and a newsletter with it. Instagram, The Fear Guru. So uh, easy enough to find. Same thing on Facebook, Patrick Sweeney, Fear Guru, and uh, LinkedIn, Patrick Sweeney, Fear Guru as well. So those are, oh, and uh, Twitter is at PJ Sweeney. So those are probably the best places they can find me. And then on Amazon or Audible, the new audio version just came out of Fear is Fuel. And that's a lot of fun. And uh, so far is doing really well. So I got fearisfuel.com in front of me. Does that redirect? Does your uh, no? That's a, that's that's specific, Jonathan, to the uh, to the book. Um, okay. And PJ Sweeney has more of the blog, some more of the research, and and goes you know a little bit deeper than the fear is fuel is is specifically just for the book and uh, okay. uh, promotion around that. Which uh, social platform are you most active on? Uh, I would say, um, uh, now it's probably leaning towards Instagram. Okay, cool. I have followed you officially. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah, looking I'll forward to seeing back. what, all right, let's look forward and, to seeing And I've that. been doing clubhouse, uh, a little bit lately too. So oh, uh, in the clubhouse, cool. <laughs> yep. I've not figured that out yet. I'm, I, all these things come out, I go grab my name and then I'm like, I'll get to it. I haven't, we've got an I invite, so we just got to get around to it. Right. I've already done it. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm in, I just don't know how to use it yet. So, well, <laughs> you know, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's very addictive. Right. And, yeah, um, but the, th the thing I found so far is you don't want to do anything alone. So get like two or three of your guests and I'm happy to do it anytime and say, Hey, we're jumping on uh, you know, Thursday at five and we're just, we're going to talk about, uh, we're, whatever it, you know, we're going to talk yeah. about the, the next, uh, can line award or, or whatever it is. And, and, you know, just jump on and start a conversation and it usually, it usually works out pretty well. Cool. All right. Patrick, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure, man. We've really enjoyed it. We could talk all day about this, but I will be reaching out to you uh, regarding the other podcasts and getting you on that one. We'll uh, we'll stay in touch for sure. I look forward to it. Well, Jonathan, Sean, thank you guys so much. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I love your show. I love the uh, the idea of the influence of a pint because I've been influenced by them for, for my whole life. <laughs> so Absolutely. I look, look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, guys. Hey, thank you, Patrick. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good stuff, man. Love oh, it, man. I've got like books <laughs> of neuroscience and all that kind of stuff. Joe Dispenza and all kinds of stuff. Like, I could talk about that all day. Oh, it's, I, uh, I've got it's so many people. I want to send the link to this episode over to from what you right? talked about, right? Yeah, Friends sure. and family that could uh, benefit from from this alone. But, but yeah. Good stuff. You know, it's uh, per fear is a motivating factor for sure. And, yep. uh, you know, I love the uh, love the chapter on scaring yourself every day. Unless you, eat, <laughs> unless you eat bugs and fear is not a factor for you, right? From the old Joe, <laughs> the early Joe Rogan days. That's right. That's right. I was watching. Have you ever watched that show, uh, Naked and Afraid? Naked, it's on uh, Discovery. The, yeah. The, where they're out in the woods yeah. naked. Yeah. Yep. I love that show. It's so kind of, it's kind of addicting. It is. It really is. So I, I happened to, when I was travel, I was out of town this week, happened to be flipping through and saw and, you know, zoned in on the Discovery channel and it was catching an episode where, um, you know, they're out there. So it, it was really interesting, the dynamic. So there's two, obviously there's always a, a, a male and a female, mm -hmm. but on this particular episode, the uh, the female was like she was really running down the guy in the first few days because it seemed like he was just um he was like he wasn't prepared she was like i thought you knew about you know survival <laughs> skills and all this stuff and you don't know jack you know so she i mean she was just berating for like the yeah. last like the first you know, the first day is always good because they're getting to know each other. But it was right. like, you know, by the third day, she was just like on top of him because he just seemed like he was slow moving. And and so what happened, the the dynamic changed, though, over time, by the seventh day, her her psyche just got to the point where she had had enough of just being around him or she was using that excuse as his lack of um, or so she said lack of motivation that she had enough and she tapped out. She left. Yeah. He ended up finishing 21. He'd spent 21 days out there. 
you know, and so I, think I remember, but, yeah, I think I remember seeing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he was like kind of a Samoan type guy and she was, um, you know, she was a lesbian. I don't know if you remember if that rings a bell, but not that it has anything to do with it, but it, it was just yeah. like, um, you know, he was just like methodical about everything and she wanted him to constantly, but she was acting out of, um, complete fear i think you know it yeah. kind of reminded me she was like acting out of complete fear but she was blaming it on him and he was just kind of like taking each day as it came mm -hmm. and just kind of like really intentionally assessing every situation without being fearful yeah. and and she you know she translated that into be just being you know an idiot right. um but well, she tapped like, out early you know it's kind of like the you know 24 7 hustle and grind crowd yep who think if you're not doing that, then you're That's not right. working. And exactly. you know, even as, even as Patrick said, that ended up almost killing him. Exactly. Right. So, and, and you don't want to be doing nothing, but there mm -hmm. is the moderation and the steadiness and the, right. you know, the whole tortoise and the hare thing that exactly I think, uh, you know, that's a classic fable for a reason. Like those, mm -hmm. those things are, have a lot of truth in them. Yep. Um, no so doubt. yeah. Hey, uh, real quick. What did you rate your, your beer? Oh Yeah. So for an IPA, I'm going to give this a high one. It was, uh, it's actually 9%. I don't know if I mentioned this. Oh, wow. 9% uh, ABV. But this is actually pretty good for, um, you know, for, a, it, but it is an Imperial IPA. Right. So it's a little heavier. Uh, I'm going to give this one a four, four, three, four, three. Wow. Yeah, that yeah. is. I, I do think the Imperial IPAs have a totally different kind of yep. taste Absolutely. to them for sure. Uh, I'm going to give this a four or five. It was just, oh, nice. it was the perfect amount of like, a, you know, if it had, a, it wasn't super sweet, which a lot of these in this 12% range can definitely get too sweet. Right. And it did not have that sweetness. So that was nice. Um, nice. Yeah. It was only a three out of five on sweetness on their little chart. Um, and I had a little bit of two out of five on bitterness. So I think it balanced, balanced it out nicely. Sure. Cool. So yeah, I'll give it a four or five. Good stuff. I may have another tonight with the cigar. Oh, yeah. Good, so. man. Yeah. Um, so that wraps it up. Thanks That's guys it. for listening. As always, you can find us persuasion by the pint.com. You can find us on all of your social media platforms and, uh, Sean, we'll see you on the next episode, man. All right. See ya.